Good morning, everyone. This is Jeffy Kennedy, author of Fantasy Romance and Romantic Fantasy. I'm here with my first cup of coffee. That's good. That's delicious. It is Monday, March 7th. If you're on video, you'll see it's kind of cold gray light here. Um, we're just like in for snow. It's very spring snow, lots of squalls. Um, but yeah, we got a lot of snow yesterday. Supposed to get more today. It's sticking in places, but otherwise melting. Again, very springy. Some of you have asked about my chimes and what is the figure on the chimes. And I realize it doesn't show up well if you're on videos, even if you're on video. So I'm going to show this to you. If you can see. Yeah, it's it's subtle. It's um, It was a gift. It's from Ireland and it is a Celtic dog. And it sort of turned back on itself, wrapped up in different Celtic knots um, and dark brown. If you haven't ever seen the visual on it, it's um, made of clay. And so, oops, and now I just, my chimes just came apart in my hands. That's what I get for messing with it. I'll have to restring it. Um, Maybe I wasn't supposed to reveal the secret nature of the chimes. Oh, I have to set that there. It's um, It's got a nice bit of potent magic for those of who are aware of such things. All right, so um, busy weekend. Saturday was crazy. It was funny because uh, <laughs> one gal that I was in a meeting with was um, ever so slightly testy and she said well I, you know that she was at a conference and she said I am in my fourth meeting of the day and I wanted to say well I'm in my sixth meeting of the day <laughs> I did not say that but I was I think that's one of those things that's like never assume that other people are like having it so much easier than you do even if they are not being testy um it was fine uh a lot of good stuff got done on saturday uh sort of the upshot for the whole weekend is i like totally caught up on sofa stuff um that was really the big thing and there was a lot to get caught up on i don't know what happened but i got back to inbox zero on all of my email. Um, I did a lot of that yesterday. I was, um, I sort of did a split. I did not have an unplugged day. I have not been able to do that before. Well, it's moved around because like when I was in Los Angeles, I was able to unplug because I was out doing things, right? So yesterday morning, Sunday morning, I was able to um, hang out. It was really nice because I, I was not feeling great on Saturday. Uh, I think I got overserved on Friday evening. Um, although, so Friday evening I had uh, drinks and dinner with my friend Megan and a couple of her friends. And then Saturday morning I was just feeling really kind of rough. And I was like, geez, you know, maybe I drank too much wine, you know, like with the, with the 16 8 fasting that I've been doing wine is hitting me harder but then i saw megan again last night because we went to see a movie that's my big news is that we went to see cyrano with peter dinklage and Haley bennett um in an actual movie theater and that was really fun that's the first time i've been in a movie theater since i was trying to decide when it was it was like january of 2020 and i was trying to remember what movie it was So two years since I'd been in a movie theater, a little bit more. And so that was really great. Uh, but she mentioned she was not feeling good on Saturday morning. So maybe, maybe the food wasn't great. The people, at, it's a local place that I've always really liked, but the owners are selling and, you know, it's like, eh. So 
anyway, Saturday night, I went to bed pretty early and slept a long time and woke up Sunday morning even earlier than I expected to, but um, everybody was up. The, the cats were up and wanted fed, and David was up and grumpy because the cats had been bugging him because they were up and wanted fed. And morning is my feeding time. So that banished my ideas. I was going to lie in bed and read for a while, but I thought, well, I'd get up and feed the cats. So I got up and fed the cats, and then they all went back to bed. <laughs> all three of them, the cats and David. And... I made my latte and I made a fire in the fireplace because even though it was it was really pretty when I first woke up because one of the things I love about this house one of the many things is that when I wake up I can see um, out my window and I don't think the camera's gonna show this now it's just gonna look like a blur of light but I could see this view down the valley I could see the sky from the bed and um, there were these you know, pink clouds being lit up by the sunrise, cotton candy pink and rose gold, and it was just gorgeous. And so by the time I finished making my latte and feeding the cats, uh, the clouds had come in and it started to snow, very heavy snow. So I put a fire in the fireplace and I sat in my favorite reading chair by the fire and I read um, Juliette Morillier which transcript is going to hate. So I finished book three of the Seven Waters series, um, Child of the Prophecy, and now I'm on book four, um, Heir of Seven Waters. So yeah, definitely continuing my kick on this particular author, whose name I shall not repeat because transcript. Um, yeah, she's really amazing. She's so good. It's very interesting that she's done this on all three books so far, that from about 80 to 95% of the book, because I'm reading on Kindle so I can see, she has built up so much dread of the possible terrible, awful outcome of the story that I almost can't bear it. She has her characters struggling so hard against the things that are happening and that I am just dread is the best word I can come up with I am just full of dread that they're not going to succeed that and even though I know even though I know that they're going to succeed that I know this is the promise she does kill some of her characters and that creates more of a sense of peril for me for as a reader because it's like Sometimes I worry about which characters might die, and some do. But there are happy endings as far as the protagonists. But I, it's unreal to me how much she drags out this dread at the end. And I feel like I could learn from this because I know that I think I'm too nice sometimes. Do you guys think this? I mean, I sometimes I think my perception. Actually, I know. I know my perception of my own books is different than the perception of the reader because it surprises me when people say that I write dark things because they don't seem that dark to me. Um, but I feel like I resolve difficulties too easily. Like on um, Fiery Crown, I was thinking about grabbing a copy, but I won't. I have so many copies of the Fiery Crown, you guys, because pandemic because <laughs> we're going to have this huge launch event and no. Yeah. Um, so like in the fiery crown, if you haven't read it, close your ears for like half a minute. But at the end, when they are doing the, the rescue from the Citadel, uh, my editor said that she thought they got in and out too easily. And so I had to go back and weave that in. So I worry about this somewhat. If, if you have your hands over your ears, you can come back. <laughs> um, I worry about this sometimes with my books because especially the self-published ones I know I'm often coming in under the wire which I hate I, I want to get back to where I'm not doing that and hopefully on um, Storm Princess and the Raven King I will I will do this um, Megan Sienna Deutsch 
Hi, Megan. I know she listens sometimes. Made a really good suggestion that I just go ahead and set a new um, pre-order date, a new release date, and just make it well out from when I think I can finish. And I think I probably will do that. Um, I'm just, I need to get like into the book a little bit more because I did not, I took the day off on Friday. I'm still empty brained. I'm hoping I've got the juice back today. So yeah, I feel like I maybe need to go back and spend more time on these endings and like draw out the dread and the peril of resolving the conflict. Thoughts? What do you guys think? Of course, I might be preaching to the choir there here because the readers who think that I resolve stuff too easily um, may not be reading my books anymore. <laughs> I can't believe how long Julia, and here we are transcript, how long Julia Morillier is able to draw out that final conflict. <sighs> And it's, I was telling Megan about this uh, over drinks. We had drinks before the movie. And she was saying, well, it sounds stressful. And I was thinking, well, it is kind of stressful. But at the same time, it's, I don't know. It's, it's also really satisfying in a way. I don't know. We had an argument about something else. And I realize I've lost my initial topic. Maybe I'll think of it and wind back. Oh, I think I will. Because um, she was saying that she was watching, that she didn't do much over the weekend. She, you know, because it was very snowy. It was a really good weekend to tuck in. And she did not have her son. Her son was with her ex. And her um, guy, Charlie, was out of town. So she said she ended up doing a lot of, you know, had her fire going and lolling on the couch and binge watching stuff. And she said she was watching Vikings Valhalla on Netflix. And she asked me if I was watching it. And I said, no, I don't like the Viking show. shows. I said, David likes them, but I don't. And she said, well, why don't you like them? I thought you would love that stuff. And I'm like, no. Uh, uh, brutality, violence, just... I said, I don't like Vikings in general because they are... Um, it said, you know, like they killed my ancestors. <laughs> I just there's just not much about the Viking, Viking, the Viking mythology that is appealing to me. David likes it. I don't. I don't like how they just go out and like ravage and brutalize people. And she said, "But did you like Game of Thrones?" And I said, "Yeah, I did like Game of Thrones." And she said, "Well, they're the same thing." And I was like, "What?" Okay, so you guys, Viking stuff and Game of Thrones. She said, "Well, didn't you think?" Um, like the, the people in the north, those north people, and I said the the Starks. And she said, yes, the Starks. They were basically Vikings. They were running around with, you know, wearing furs and stuff. Now, now upon consideration, now I'm wondering if she was thinking about like the wall and the wild walkers, maybe. But <laughs> anyway, she even asked our waiter, you know, because he like brought our drinks right then. And she said, don't you think that like Vikings and Game of Thrones that there's a lot of crossover? And he kind of looked confused. And then finally he said, well, maybe, you know, like the Greyjoys because they had ships. And I said, you know, the thing about Vikings, one of the things that defines Vikings is that they go a Viking. They go out and they go a Viking. And nobody in Game of Thrones was going out a Viking. We got nowhere with this argument. But... I did think that it was a funny conversation. She was like, well, what do you like about Game of Thrones? Because she said, I thought the same thing about that. It was all violence and dirtiness and brutality. And I was like, no. It's because there was all of that political maneuvering, right? Anyway, doesn't matter in the grand scheme, not. But that was sort of how we were going round and round. Um, <laughs> and I confess I don't really know how I got there but it was a funny conversation so um so yeah it was I guess with uh what the books that I'm reading and so forth um getting back to work today going to see the movie in the movie theater so I want to talk about Cyrano and uh 
I was just looking at my notes and thinking about. <clears throat> I don't know if I want to talk about this, though I still have times. For some reason, this is bugging me. Um, and I wrote it down and I was thinking about it again this morning. Um, so maybe I'm, I don't know, the fact that I keep thinking about it then comes back to me. I know one thing I had didn't mention earlier for one of the many things I did on Saturday was I got to interview Julia Quinn, uh, who turned out to be absolutely delightful. She was lovely. Uh, during the interview, she spotted the Rita behind me and asked about it. Uh, it was really fun talking to her. I think they're going to post that video. I will share it when it comes up. But um, yeah, that was really a great, great thing to get to do. So my thing that's been bugging me is I was just remembering a friend that I had a long time ago and why this is coming back to my mind, I don't know. But maybe because I've been thinking about friendships and thinking about jealousy and things, you know, like sometimes people who are ostensibly our friends say things to us that come across funny. And I remember saying something to her and I can't remember exactly what it was, but I was talking about, you know, like every once in a while you have something that you love to wear, some outfit that you love. And probably this is for the girls. Sorry, guys. Maybe you guys have this too. A favorite t-shirt. <laughs> I'm sorry. That's, that was wrong. Um, but every once in a while, like you have something that you feel super cute in and that you just love and nobody ever compliments you on it. Nobody ever says anything about it. And my mom and I have talked about this. It's like, it's a funny thing. And then there's other things that people always say you look great in. And so if you want to, you know, like have a power thing, you know, be powerful that day, you wear the thing that people say, you know, it's like, do you wear the thing that people say you look great in that people always compliment? Or do you wear the thing that makes you feel good? but an, an ongoing conundrum. So I had said something to my friend about this. You know, it's like, oh, you know, the, whatever this is, you know, I always love this thing, but nobody ever says that I look nice in it. And I wonder why. And she said, well, you know, sometimes we just shine too brightly. And I even wrote this down. And this is like, I don't know, 20 years later, I'm still thinking about it. Sometimes we shine too brightly. And it's like, okay, so I guess, I guess it's incumbent upon me not to shine so brightly. Isn't that a funny thing? I don't know why it's been coming back to me. So Cyrano, I want to talk about Cyrano and I'm going to talk about the ending. So if you don't want to get spoiled on the ending, tap out now. Um, I enjoyed Cyrano. Um, I did not enjoy it as much as I wanted to. Peter Dinklage and Haley Bennett were great. Uh, they did a wonderful job acting. It was beautifully filmed. It's Joe Wright. Unfortunately, it was Joe Wright, Anna Karenina, not Joe Wright, Pride and Prejudice, Atonement. And I do think that this is something that happens with creators is they start getting enchanted with themselves and what they do and they go over the top. Um, Joe Wright could have hauled this back a whole lot because it was like over the top in places. It was also incredibly gorgeous. Uh, Megan and I were both trying to figure out where it was filmed and it turns out it was Sicily. Uh, the set was amazing. There was the trademark Joe Wright sense of like 360 degree ambiance, the way he builds the world. I feel like he's unparalleled. It's just amazing. The costumes were gorgeous. The, there were these wonderful, um, you know, he leaned into the fact that it's a musical and there were these wonderful scenes where like the, the guards are practicing with the swords. They're doing the fencing practice in the background, but it's like a ballet. Um, and, various other scenes where they're talking about love and people are kneading the dough and lifting the bread and it's like a ballet. Gorgeous. Um, Roxanne, Haley Bennett plays Roxanne. Roxanne's outfits are beautiful. Uh, they went with these amazing, very filmy fabrics played with color. They use colors, gorgeous. 
um, dialogue is scintillating. Uh, Peter Dinklage, I thought, did an amazing job of being emotionally torn. I thought almost too much at times, a little over the top. I thought Roxanne did not come off well in this story. And now I kind of want to go back and watch other versions of Cyrano. Um, I know that there's the, um, the Steve Martin one, Roxanne, and then there's Cyrano de Bergerac from the early 90s with um, Gérard Depardieu. I don't remember who else was in that one. Let's look up and see. I'm going to go long today. Do you guys care? Mix up for the days that I can't think of anything to say. Who played Roxanne in that one? Anne Broche. Who is Anne Broche? Do you guys know who she is? Maybe she's just not on my radar. Same age as me. Born in 66. She's known for Cyrano de Bergerac, so maybe that's why. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, and of course, in the Steve Martin version in Roxanne, that was, and I'm blanking on her name, the gal who was in Splash. Oh my gosh. You guys are all shouting it at me, I know. What's her name with the long blonde hair? Yes, yes, I can't hear you. Um, Roxanne, was that, that was 87? Yeah. Oh, Daryl Hannah. Yeah, why couldn't I think of that? And I remember liking that one. So now I want to rewatch those because I want to see how it ended. Uh, because this one leaned much more into war. Um, I assumed it was Napoleonic War, although they didn't say. You guys know me. I'm not great on history. Um, but it had a tragic ending. Um, and in a way that I felt like was not earned. This was a not earned tragic ending. So here I'm very explicitly talking about how it ends. At the, so Cyrano and Christian, who is, you know, her love, you guys know the story, right? Christian's the very handsome uh, soldier who's inarticulate. Cyrano is, well, he's Peter Dinklage in this movie, so it's more than him just being ugly or having a big nose. He's actually... I think, um, well, little person, right? In the movie, they said midget, which I thought was interesting because it might have been more um, within the time because I, I think now the preferred language is little person. So it was much more, he even says, you know, a tall, beautiful woman is not going to be with a midget. And so they both go off to war, uh, Christian and, and Cyrano. And... Christian like gets very upset when he discovers that um, Cyrano is in love with Roxanne and has been writing to her every day and, and all of this and that Roxanne doesn't actually love Christian because she's, she's written that she's in love with his soul. And so he like goes running, screaming up and stands there and gets shot. It's like he doesn't even do anything noble or useful in their uh, losing battle. <laughs> it just like, so that was much. I did not like that because um, he's like a soldier's son and all of this. Um, anyway, so then Cyrano gets shot, but he goes home. And then if they do this thing three years later, it's like, wait, what? Three fucking years. Three years, Cyrano's back in Sicily. He's with Roxanne. He's dying. And I mean, it's like three years later and then a day, you know, it's like one day, even a couple hours. And it shows him like all this time he's been uh, pining after her and he sees her every week. And finally he confesses his love and she says that she loves him and he dies. <laughs> what were they doing for three fucking years? I mean, what is the point of this? What? Why? Why? Why do we have this three-year lapse where they're just suffering? Um, I don't understand this, storytellers. Don't tell me that they spent three years not talking to each other about these very important things and then just so you can produce your tragic ending. Um, I can't even. I'm done with it. <laughs> End rant. Um... So you all have a great Monday. Have a great week. If you've seen Cyrano, if you see Cyrano, let me know what you think. Um, you know what? And 
all of you who want to shine brightly, go out there and shine as brightly as you want to. All right. I will talk to you all tomorrow. Take care. Bye-bye.